Recording. Sylvia Rivera. Original name, Ray Rivera Mendoza. I was born in 1951. I had a mother and I had a father. In 1953, my mother decided to try to off herself. At the same time, she tried to kill me. She knew I was going to have a very hard life. And yes, I've had a very hard struggle. I tell these stories of my life because I know that my children in later years, my transgender community will understand we have to stand up and speak for ourselves. We have to fight for ourselves. We saved their lives. We were the front liners of the so-called 1969 rebellion of the Stonewall. I don't know how long I'm going to be around, but I wanted to be told the way I feel. Sylvia and I talked about it when she was in the hospital, and really neither one of us could come up with why we, of all people, stayed friends for 33 years. I've always said we were the oddest of odd couples, but I was in my 40s at that time. Sylvia was 19. Um, Sylvia was basically a Puerto Rican street drag queen. We didn't have transgendered people in those days. I was uh, a wasp who had uh, come out of the establishment. Uh, Stonewall was peculiar. It meant many things to many people. Here was a riot, and here, uh, for the first time, well, first time any of us were seeing uh, gays fight back. I think one of the things that impressed Sylvia most was the um, the line of street kids doing the, the rockette, we are the Stonewall girls, because I mean, this was in total defiance. This was getting out and saying to the world, to the police, to everybody, I'm a little faggot and it was we are the stonewall girls we wear our hair in curls we don't wear underwear we show our pubic hair it certainly uh was the turning point in, in the life of sylvia rivera the one aspect of sylvia's activism going all the way back to 1970 in star house was the specific issue of dealing with the homeless transgender population. And Star House came out of the organization, organization STAR, which stood for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, and it was the uh, brainstorm of Sylvia, Marsha P. Johnson, and Bubbles Rose Lee. Marsha and Sylvia got a hold of this building and they were using it, it's sort of the model for Transy House here, in fact, uh, as a uh, kind of collective place for the uh, trans girls that were out living on the street, you know, homeless. Marsh and Sylvia mothered them. I mean, they mothered everybody. So I considered Sylvia to be my mother. Everybody in this house called her mom. I mean, she was... Uh, well, that's what she was. Sylvia left the movement uh, after the first three, three or four years because in this very park, she had been refused the right to speak and it was right here with the rally after one of the uh, the pride marches it was like the fourth anniversary gay march when i was beat up on stage y'all better quiet down what the fuck? sylvia did grab the mic and speak and she roared revolution now Give me a G! Give me an A! Give me a Y! Give me a P! Give me an O! Give me a W! Give me an A! Give me an R! Give me a 
I have never seen anyone so so lost. I mean, Sylvia's world had suddenly just collapsed, and Sylvia left the movement for 20 years. I've known Sylvia informally, you might say, since 1969-1970, the Gay Activist Alliance. We were arch enemies for the first 22 years of the 32 years we knew one another. And that is a story which I think is so remarkable. The person that I used to consider a very arch enemy or moral political enemy, someone I had no use for whatsoever, ended up becoming one of my best friends in life and literally came in here and ran my business and became one of the most special, wonderful, incredible people I ever knew. How many people have one of their worst enemies or oldest enemy become one of their best friends and saviors? Have you ever spent a winter in these, in, you know, like out of doors in an I spent, environment like this? I spent winters with um, Marsha and some of the other drag queens many years ago before Star House and during, you know, during the beginning of Star House out in the street, but it wasn't like this. This uh -huh. is like a complete new atmosphere for me. They didn't have homeless encampments in those days. We didn't. Did we, we slept in hallways. Or either Marsh or I had a hotel room where we snuck everybody in. You know. The pier was actually established a few years before I got here. I came down to be nosy and I moved in and took over basically as the big mother that I am. Over here, this was part of my house. This is my little segment of the house because Vinnie and Tom live on that side. You can mm -hmm. go in and you know, it's, you know, very... This is my closet where I keep my clothes, yeah. Any gowns? Yeah, all the gowns, you know, I don't need them. I was comfortable for a lot of years, you know, like I said, we owned a house. My lover and I did own a house. And actually what happened, you know, it's been like three years is when, Ma when, when I got that telegram that Marshall was dead. I mean, I lost a lot of my incentive to do anything. And when she died, part of me went with her because one of our packs was that we would always cross River Jordan together. And to me, this is the River Jordan, the Hudson River. This is not my first time that I've hit bottom as far as, you know, because of my drinking and whatnot, but... But what's given me a lot of incentive right now is, like, being back in the village instead of being in Westchester and keeping myself confined from what my life has always been is to fight for something. Because most of the kids here were alcoholics and people with AIDS. And that's one of the reasons that I, like, I stayed on for as long as I did until we got thrown out, because there were people here that really needed help, and the community was not here to help them. But it, it hurts to see that people are not being helped. I may spend the winter out here for the simple fact that if I can't see them off the street, why should I go get shelter for myself? Because right now, I have to prove a point as a Stonewall veteran. I find myself back in this situation, but as I look at the river a lot of times, and Marsha gives me a lot of strength, is that I got to keep fighting for somebody. Marsha was a fighter. We were both fighters. I actually feel her spirit telling me, you got to keep fighting, girly, because it's not time for you to cross the River Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> After the interview on the pier in 96, we became very good friends, because then she came here and started working stringing Christmas ornaments. It was just incredible. You know, I, I said to myself, I said, she wants to work at the store. This queen is going to last three hours a day, you know, two days at the most, please, no, you know, but, oh, I'll give her a shot. You know what I mean? Like, it was just enough where I said, oh, I'll give her, you know, I'll give anybody a try. You know what I mean? And in my amazement, she turned out to be 
incredible. They tell me, my computer man just told me a couple weeks ago, I didn't know this at the time, but when I would really be getting on Sylvia's nerves, she'd be humming this tune. Yes, we have no bananas, we have no bananas today. In 95, about, I was at a thing Clags was doing um, up on 42nd Street at the university there, and uh, they had a, uh, the last panel was this thing on Stonewall, and uh, Silvio was there. And I was like, hi, remember me? I'm one of your kids, you know, that sort of thing. And where have you been? I guess I was intrigued by her, you know, when I first saw her. Because she was had a lot of energy, you know. She was talking about how she'd been homeless and she'd been living on a pier and that sort of thing. And I said, uh, hey, you're not homeless. I got a, a place. As long as I got a place, you're not homeless. Yeah, that sort of thing, you know. So she... Um, she didn't move in right away, but she started coming around, you know. Julia had been close with me and Rusty, and uh, she was living here with us at the time. I just started spending a lot of time with her. She asked if she could stay here. The idea was she was going to live here. She'd do some work in the backyard, do some work around the house in uh, lieu of paying rent. Maybe this would be more important to me than it would be to her, because... Uh... After, you know, when we first moved in together, she was like, she made this, she was like decorating, you know, and, uh, you know, that was when, when Pokemon was first starting, so she, she would like Pikachu, and so I bought one of these for her. <laughs> the first couple of years were hardest because when she first moved in, I mean, I loved Sylvia to death, but she was a, uh, hardcore alcoholic. I mean, she was an unqualified drunk. When she, mo when she moved here, she would drink every day. I mean, she would come home from work, sit down in a chair, uh, open her second or third uh, quart of vodka for the day, and uh, that was about it. She spent all of her time in the living room downstairs, and uh, she slept down there and watched TV down there. And uh, I just remember, you know, I wanted to do things for her, you know, and she, um, she used to go like this to me when I would come in, you know, and I'd go back like that to her, and she, um, she used to call me an angel, you know, because I guess of the fact I was helping her, you know, and... Julia would come in to help Sylvia, so, I mean, I saw this relationship literally take root and grow. And, uh, Julia and Sylvia became an item. Chelsea, you know, asked, asked me whether we were lovers and so I asked her and she, you know I mean they almost became inseparable and then that got where you never saw one without the other I was at work and she said uh, you know she came up to me and said well I've been thinking about it all day you know and she said I've decided we are lovers but what was so incredible is that Julia did something for Sylvia that no one else in the world ever did after a while uh Julia, uh, Sylvia quit drinking, uh, apparently, you know, the relationship with Julia gave her some impetus uh, for doing that. Julia kept Sylvia sober. No, no one has ever been as enthusiastic about me as she was. I mean, she was like, she would, um, you know, she would caress me like I was a gift. Julia gave Sylvia that extra leg she needed. And then she got like incredibly politically active again and uh, started doing some really wonderful work and you know she was more her she really was ferocious when she got sober straight on you know <coughs> right. powerful you know she was totally responsible i mean first time in her life i was just so proud of her and i used to tell her constantly and it used to make her so happy and she's just saying, oh, I'm so happy when you tell me you're proud of me. She rose above circumstances. I mean, she, getting me in you know, a child prostitute at the age of 10, you know, and, and a drug addict and all these awful experiences that went on in her life. And you would have thought that she would have just, as she got older, would have gotten uglier and more mm -hmm. twisted. And instead, somehow, she went through this, this roller coaster ride of tragedy and suddenly bloomed like a... A, a new rose of spring or something. Mm -hmm. I should say an opium poppy. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, other people can talk about this better than I can. I mean, she got religion at the end of her life. She was very actively involved in the MCC. Um, she came to the church about four years ago and began attending on Sunday on a regular base basis. She began volunteering in the food pantry, which uh, serves um, people who are living in poverty in the city and also people living with AIDS. And uh, eventually, the director of our food pantry resigned, and we hired Sylvia as the director of the food pantry. I call these, but I have them lined up like this. My soldiers to fight hunger. That's my little nickname. Sylvia had a very deep, uh, deep passion for uh, people living in poverty in this city. Not just the trans community, not just the queer community, but anybody uh, who didn't have the kind of housing or the kind of clothing or the kind of medical care or the kind of resources that it really takes to survive, much less live, in New York City. I can go home and say that I've actually tried to make a difference. And not sit down and talk about it or plan to do something about it. She just had this way about her that people from all walks of life would end up here getting groceries or lunches or some kind of food or clothing or housing assistance from us. And she really um, helped us, I think, develop that ministry and take it the next step. It makes me feel good that we're able to reach a few people, but um, in the long run, it's still not enough, but every little bit helps. The other thing that will always stick with me is while, when we were really wrestling with Sonda, uh, she came to me one day and asked me if I understood uh, what I was doing in terms of calling for an inclusive sound if I knew what that meant and I said that I did it meant that I wouldn't leave her behind she didn't let people go blindly into the positions that they took she she wanted to make sure that you understood what you were saying what you might be giving up what you might be sacrificing in order to stand with her and I really admire that kind of um, not only forthrightness but that kind of honesty and integrity the transgender movement is very marginalized and she had a vision and she continued to fight for that vision. Even Matt Foreman and Joe Graybars had come to have a meeting with her in the hospital and uh, about the Sonda bill and Sylvia was being so anxious to get that passed before she died. I mean, on your own deathbed, to summons ESPA, the people from the Empire State Agenda Committee, to your deathbed to plead the case, <clears throat> don't leave my people behind. Brilliant strategy. I didn't sit in on the meeting. I went out to get something to eat. But Reverend Pat sat in on the meeting. There were four of us, actually, in her room. Matt and Joe agreed to come to her hospital bedside and meet with her about Sonda. And when I came back up, Sylvia was extremely happy, whatever they had said uh, satisfied Sylvia. She was able to actually negotiate um, in an amazingly competent uh, way as she lay there in her hospital bed um, and got uh, ESPA to agree to having a trans person on their board of directors and was able to present her list of demands to them.